way beyond ultraviolet. Okay. So like the gamma radiation is much further along than ultraviolet. Okay, so then what would be the definition for that? Just ultraviolet like, catastrophe? Yeah. I'll talk about it in a second. Okay. Ready? Yeah. All right, so everything in the universe that apparently is going invisible to us because we're shifting into the ultraviolet. Okay? As in a heated option. Yeah. Well, you take an object, you heat it up, drop it in the microwave, drop it in the oven, give it enough time, and it should turn invisible. It should. That's what we believe classically. That if you continue to dump energy in there, you expect it to shift into the ultraviolet, which is higher energy. More energy that matter has, the more energy it's going to kick out, the higher frequency of light shifting into the ultraviolet. It goes infrared, low energy, visible light, which we see, and then ultraviolet, which is high energy. Like I said, there are animals on this planet, chickens and bees for one, we'll see in the ultraviolet range, but that's trivia. So, doesn't happen. When was the last time you put a turkey in the oven and it turned invisible? Well, well maybe after you take the turkey out of the oven. Well, you couldn't see it through all the smoke. There you go. It doesn't happen. The ultra, everything doesn't shift into the ultraviolet the more energy you put into it. What ends up happening is that you get a behavior that looks like this. So if I continue to dump more and more energy, or in this case, temperature, our light does this to frequency. It peaks, it gets to a value, it generates a tremendous amount of light at that peak. Now this is low energy, this is high energy. Okay. So most of my energy is somewhere in the, in, the, in the middle here. There's a few pieces of light that come out that are high energy. There's a few pieces of light that come out low energy. But most of it tends to peak. Now what we expected to happen was something like this. That the more energy, the hotter it got, the more the frequency would, and then eventually it'd shift in the ultraviolet. And if I still could dump more energy in there, it would go shifting into the gamma radiation. Doesn't happen, okay? That's what we predicted. This is what we ended up with. And that's a problem. Because our understanding of matter has now just been violated. And not in a pleasant way. It's not a violation possible in a pleasant way. We believe, <laughs> we believe that it was going to behave like that, and it behaves like this. Our understanding of the universe is now flawed. Everything we believe in at that moment has just been disproven. That is the ultraviolet catastrophe. We've collected data, hard data, that predicts, that doesn't predict what we expected. Okay? We're collecting real data. And you guys could literally do this yourselves. Except for not in my classroom because you're going to have to be generating a really high temperature objects to make them glow. So please don't do that and use the proper state. Okay? Doesn't behave the way we expected. So we have to throw out all of our models for thermal dynamics. All of them get pitched. We have to throw away all of our models for phases of matter. All of those need to get pitched. So that's why it's a catastrophe. Everything we believe about the classical model is wrong. So now we have to come up with a new idea. Cool? That makes sense? Yeah. Um, so since okay, so since we had that theory, we had to have had some proof that when you heat something up, things turn lighter, right? Well, and it does. Well, okay. It my does. question is, why why do things turn lighter when you heat them up? Like well, why does well, that happen? Well, if you think about the molecular model, and you think about well, let's use a molecular model. When you dump energy into a system, we use the word heat, say dumping energy into an object. The hotter that object gets, the more molecular motion inside that object. The more molecular motion you get, the more light it's going to start to generate. So we believed in that model, that if you keep doing this, that all that molecular motion is going to increase, 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 increase. So you're going to get atoms that initially were vibrating like this. What's that? But then there's a point where it just turns into gas. So if you heated iron up until it was invisible. Right, but that, what that happens? Would... What happens if you don't use iron? What happens if you use a, another substance that doesn't vaporize that? At a, but um, is there any substance that does? Like, graphite is high. really takes a lot of heat to melt graphite. Right. So I mean that's why we use it. In theory, it, well, I mean not in theory. Doesn't everything? 
Everything can shift, will shift, yeah. if you keep dumping energy into it. You're absolutely so right. So won't, like, in theory, like, won't everything shift before it turns ultraviolet? But we're still talking about molecular motion. If I take an iron and I and I heat it up and I melt it, I go, oh crap, I'm, I'm done. I'm not done. Keep heating up iron. What happens to iron? It gets hotter and hotter and hotter. It glows more. Well, it goes through another phase shift. It turns into gaseous iron, which I don't recommend you playing with. Still gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Still is generating a lot of light. What we're finding out, though, instead of it create, creating more at higher frequencies, it stops. It peaks at about it and generates only primarily light at that frequency. And then it goes back down. Why does it drop off? That's because of what Planck comes up. With. He's the next person I want. So what ends up happening, so the ultraviolet catastrophe happens, our atomic models all suck, so now we've got to come up with a new idea. Out of sheer frustration, the next man, Maxwell Planck, comes along and is sick and tired of being nagged over this question and throws out this wild idea. Literally, this is how it happens. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's packets of energy and light, and it's not this big magical beam that comes out of there. Maybe light is generated in small packets. That's Planck's idea. So instead of this idea of a long string of light that we still use as an argument, Planck says, screw that. Maybe there's just a small packet of light. Maybe if we look at light really, 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 really closely, we'd only see it in sections, not as one big long beam. That's Planck's argument. Planck's? What, what, wait, repeat. What's the definition? I'll give it to you in a second. So does that make sense? That's Planck's argument. It's, it's insane, it's ridiculous, but that's his argument. And he comes up with this idea out of sheer frustration. He has no idea why the universe is behaving the way it does, but he says, oh, maybe it's like this, okay? So he makes up this, he makes up this idea equation, if you will, that energy of light is equal to h times the frequency, okay? So energy, h frequency, h stands for Planck's constant. So instead of seeing waves of light, we see little packets? That's Planck's suggestion. Right. And he's right. Well, he's right. He says light exists in packets. How they prove that? Actually, Einstein's the one that proves it. Really? Yeah, he's the next one we'll talk about. But he's the one that proves it. Diana, you had a question? Uh, no. No? So this is Planck's constant. He says, well, these little bit of packets are going to be this value, this Planck length, times the frequency of that light, okay? And this is a constant. So what we end up with is a new word. That light is now going to be quantized. Quantized? Quantized. We come up with new vocabulary. So what does quantized sound like? Quantum. Quantum? What does quantum sound like? Quantum. Quantity. That's actually exactly where it's coming from. He comes up with the word quantum, but quantum is referring to quantity. It's discrete. It's discrete. It's a small packet. Energy exists in small packets, small discrete values. So when we talk about quantized objects, we're talking about things that have small packets. Now, think about that. So if I were to talk about the visible light spectrum, or if I were to talk about matter itself, what Planck is coming up with is the idea that matter is not continuous. I can't take a, a particle and keep cutting it down and down and down and down. And we already have an idea of the atomic theory, but I, I mean, even then, I can't say, well, I'm going to cut half an electron or half a neutron or half a proton. Planck is saying that there is a basement number that this value determines what that basement number is. And there's actually a Planck, Planck's constant for length, 
and there's a Planck constant for time. So we come up with these new ideas that time is con quantized, it's not continuous. It's continuous. So there's some time that this time is going to so, no, no, what, what, what does continuous mean? Never ends. Never ends. It's more than that. How many of you guys are in calculus? Calculus. Calculus. Richard is. What does continuous mean, Ben? It means that, it's a, that it is uninterrupted. It's uninterrupted. So time travels uninterrupted in our point of view, right? Right. According to Planck, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, Planck suggests that, well, he doesn't. It comes along later. That time is basically small little chunks. One chunk, next chunk, next chunk, next chunk, next chunk. That's how we can travel in time. Chunk in a sense chunk. it is. And we'll talk about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. But that's what it means. Planck is coming up with this idea, this quantization. Well, length is quantized. So I cannot travel a distance that's less than a Planck length. Right. So that it's a mathematical problem where you take something, you divide it by two. You cut it in half, cut it in half, cut it in half, cut it in half, cut it in half. And it's like, oh, you can do that forever. No, you can't. Planck constant. You're done at a particular value. The universe stops existing. So how do you measure those? How do you measure those packets? Well, it's, it's, it's Einstein that comes up with an idea. He comes up with an idea using light and uh, conductive material. So I'm going to talk about... Bernadette, what's your question real quick? Oh, um, I want to know... What happens in between the I'm sorry, packets of time? Like, if packets of time, if if they're segments of time, then I mean, obviously the the breaks in between are large enough for us to know this. But what what <laughs> we're measuring we're measuring a Planck constant in time that's something like ten to the negative thirty four seconds, which is tiny. Yeah. Okay, so there's no way of being able to get down on that level and get an idea of what is happening between one ten to the thirty-four second to the next ten to the thirty-four negative thirty-four second. So they're tiny, 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 tiny. We but don't have. they're like, what would happen in those? Would time can't stand still, or would we have a lapse back in time, or? Well, and there's there's a little more going on there. There's. When you get down to that length, there's a, there's a phenomenon called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that allows that time to bleed into one to the other. So there's really not really a space in between, but there is a space. So it's continuous, but it's not continuous. It's not continuous. You but can't kind you of. can't you can't have a stopwatch that runs to ten to the negative thirty five. It simply doesn't work. Okay. Diana, you're. Yeah, I'm just clarifying. So basically he's proposing that if we see light, like he got the idea of time coming in packets because we see a light being in packets as well. Is that what he's proposing? What he's proposing, first of all, is that light comes in packets. Right. People later on, not necessarily Planck, suggest that time comes in packets, lengths come in packets. Because light turns out to be the medium of the universe. Right. Everything we know, everything we believe, every form of energy is, has something to do with light. Okay. So we have to we have to be bound by the properties of light. Okay, I, like, I guess I was confused because you brought time into it. it no, it, it, but it's the idea of quantizing. It's, it's this value, or it's this value, or it's this value. Okay. Yeah, but does time encompass everything, or do, or do those little packets of time encompass one area, and then another packet of time encompasses? encompasses another area. Are you talking an area in space or an area in time? Just, just in general. If you think about it as an area in time, it encompasses one area in time. It's one brief instant of time. So it is that, and then it is that. And then in space? Well, it, you're talking Planck length in, in space, and it's sort of the same principle, where there's a specific value of space, and then there's the next value of space. Okay. And that's actually why a lot of our atomic models have failed in the past, because we don't take into account that idea. Cool? Can I move on? Yeah. yeah. So, the gentleman who discovers that this is true and that Planck is not crazy is Einstein. It's the only, this is how he got his Nobel Prize. He comes up with this, this insane idea, which is actually quite brilliant. If you take, 
conductive material, which aluminum, copper, gold, anything that allows electrons to move freely. And you take a piece of, or not a piece of, you take a light source, and you fire light at that piece of material, okay? You end up getting electrons to jump off. What? Okay? Why? Why? <laughs> Why? Yeah. Well, first of all, conductive materials. Why we use conductive materials is because electrons are allowed to move freely on that material. Okay? So, like, copper and gold are great, and we use our circuitry in copper and gold, because the electrons are not really bonded to the copper atoms. They're allowed to move freely about. They are. That's what makes them great conductors. If those electrons are allowed to move freely, they'll move to the next one and back and forth and all over the place. What's that, Martha? It's in a sense. So what ends up what ends up happening is, is that this light, and it's firing a very specific type of light. It's firing monochrome light. What does mono mean? What does chromic mean? Um, color. Color. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Monochromic light means that it's generating light that has one specific color, one specific frequency, according to Planck, one specific energy value. So when that piece of light comes in, it strikes that surface. Well, because it's a conductor, that surface is covered with electrons. Okay? The electrons absorb that that piece of light, which we call a photon, and if it's enough energy that it forces the electron to leave the place, you give it enough, it leaves. If you don't give it enough, nothing happens. Okay? So Einstein performed this experiment with multiple frequencies, same piece of material, multiple frequencies, firing it on the surface, generating these electrons. Okay? And what he found out that the energy of that electron is going to be equal to that minus something else. Well, that something else is the amount of energy that's required to get that electron off the planet. So imagine that your electron is down here. You fire it, you hit it with a piece of light, that electron gets up to here, and then it's forced out. Okay. Where does it go? Where does it go? Yeah. Well, in the photoelectric effect, it goes to an anode, and we measure the current. So you, you apply a voltage across here that repels the electrons. If the voltage is high enough, no electrons reach the other side. That's how we were actually able to calculate this. If you generate a voltage across there, you can say this. So where does it go after that? Would it, like, because it can't go anywhere. Can, uh, so it can't, it's not, nothing can just absorb electrons. Oh gosh, we do it all the time. Like what? We do it all the time. When? Electrons? Yeah. You absorb electrons all the time. Like what? I do. <laughs> you do. I do. Yes. Yes. What, what ends up happening, Bernadette, is that you've got the beginnings of a photocell. Uh. That electrons come down here, they strike the anode, and then they're moved through a circuit to the other back, back to the other side. You can hook up a light bulb to it, and you're generating a light. So when you look at photovoltaic cells, this is the principle in which they operate. And now, mind you, the conductive material is a little bit complicated for photovoltaic cells. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? That's Einstein, Nobel Prize. Woo! Gets a little medallion, gets a lot of money. Woo! And then gets a lot of notoriety for it. Then he goes on and does a relativity effect, and everybody's like, "Oh, that's incredible." But this is his big claim to fame in the world of physics. And it's actually his downfall, because Einstein doesn't believe in quantum mechanics. He's the first person to prove it, but he doesn't believe it. Does he believe it? You had your hand up there? I was just going to say, but he just he proves quantum mechanics, but then he doesn't believe in it. Isn't that just like... It's the, it's the principles of science. You can get the data. Like somebody proving that Santa Claus exists and then like not believing in Santa yeah. Claus. That's, like that doesn't make any sense. that's exactly it's what like ends up happening. Later on, we're dealing with a man named Niels Bohr who heads up 
everybody from quantum mechanics. Niels Bohr is the mouthpiece for quantum mechanics. And there are, are a series of arguments that are recorded between Einstein and Bohr about quantum mechanics. Einstein is anti, Bohr is pro. And what we know about the universe, we understand that quantum mechanics happens. Quantum mechanics happens. So Einstein's wrong. So Einstein proves it, yet he argues to disprove it. He argues to disprove it to the day he dies. Why? He's a classicalist. He believes in Newton's world. That if I take a rock and I throw it at something, stuff happens. And, it, it, and it's perception. He sees that happening, so he has to believe it. What we find out later when we talk about Heisenberg, De Broglie, and all those other people, that his classical, those classical models are under attack. Yeah. Our understanding of what matter is, our understanding of what light is, are all under attack by these the, this upstarts. And Einstein comes to the defense of Newton. He's like, no, 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 it's a classical model. You just don't have enough information yet. And he argues that till the day he does. Properties like entanglement, which we won't talk about. When two particles are created, they can be separated at a distance. You can make a measurement on this one, and this one behaves to that measurement. It's a process called entanglement. Einstein referred to that spooky forces at a distance because he didn't buy it. He was trying to he was trying to give it a name that was like, oh, this is spooky forces at a distance. The next thing you're going to do is tell me you understand the physics of ghosts and the Loch Ness monster. I do. <laughs> but he he's he's the he puts the first nail in. Which is really, really fascinating. But he goes off and does other things, so we're okay with that. What am I talking about next? Work function. Ah, work function. So the work function is the amount of energy that's required to liberate an electron from a conductive material. Every piece of material in the universe has its own work function. So. Magnesium has its own work function. Copper has its own work function. Gold has its own work function. And it's all determined experimentally. There isn't a mathematical equation for it. How do you, okay, what? How do, you do it? You do this. <laughs> you, no, you do. Literally, you do this. You know what find out the work function of gold. This is how you do it. You put a piece of gold there. You shine a light on it with multiple frequencies. You measure the other side of it, you get the energy, and then this pops out. If you think about it, Bernadette, this is the equation of a line. Y, M, X, B. Why are the Y, X, and X? So that means the equation for the work function? This is the work function itself. This is Einstein's photoelectric. But you just plot it. The B turns out to be your work function. Is that the symbol for work function? That's a symbol for work function, a B. Got it? Yeah. Plum pudding. Wait, 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 question. What, what is a similar way to put that into words? Like work function is? The amount of energy required to get an electron off a conductor. Want me to say it slowly? Yeah. The Right, Richard? <laughs> what? Off of a conductor? Off of conductive materials. Conductor. As in not a locomotive conductor, but as in a material that allow, has a lot of free electrons. That work? Plum pudding. Plum pudding is yummy. Plum pudding is yummy. Yummy scrumptious. I enjoy food. I don't know. I've never had it. I have a video online that has this guy that doesn't want plum pudding. So they made him a cherry tart and use that as his experiment instead of the plum pudding. So, who knows who J.J. Thompson is? He's not a race car driver. Yeah. He's the guy who came up with the plum pudding model. He actually discovered something very, very important before that. Yeah, I'm sure what it is. Uh, oh, didn't he discover itself? the electron, basically? He discovers the electron. J.J. Thompson goes <coughs> down as the guy with the wrong idea. Wait, all these theories came about without the electron? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> You're, yeah. How did he discover the electron? 
How can they have electron theories without electrons? How you can you, how see. Can you know that you're firing a light source at conductive metal and having electrons hop off if you don't know that there's an electron to be hopping off? Actually, the terminology that Einstein uses to describe the electrons coming off, the photo, it's a photo current. He measures the amount of electricity moving through the circuit. He doesn't measure the electron. <laughs> And I do believe, actually, Thompson's, Thompson discovers the electron before before Einstein comes up with the, uh, the photoelectric effect, if I remember right. He did. Okay? So Thompson, the man that has the wrong idea, who doesn't get credit for discovering the electron, even though he did. Why we all go, right? oh, Thompson, yeah, the plum pudding guy. Thompson believes that the universe is simple. He discovers the electron and says, ah, that kind of sucks. All of our atomic models are wrong because what we used to think is that the atom was indivisible. Actually, when we use the word atom, that's what it means. It's indivisible. Okay? So what he discuss, what he puts out there is that we have a bread, and inside that bread, we have plums. And if you could apply enough voltage to that bread with the plums in there, that the plums would jump out. We call those plumped electrons, we call the bread the atom. That's plum pudding. Okay, does that make sense? That's the plum pudding model. This is what he thinks the atom looks like. Yeah. They really pop out? Well, he's wrong. He's so very wrong. Does anybody know how it's proven wrong? Somebody doesn't like plum pudding. That's how they're proving it wrong. Yeah. Well, wasn't part of the problem that he said they were solid? Yeah, he believed that the objects were not necessarily solid. That this was one piece of matter. And inside that one piece of matter were the electrons. What was his name? J.J. Thompson. Thompson. <clears throat> but um, the electrons were at different energy levels, and well, the plum pudding model doesn't detect that. Well, no, that's not how it's not proven. The energy levels is not Thompson. You don't oh, come up with Rutherford. the idea of the energy levels until later. Bohr. Bohr and Rutherford. Yeah. So, does anybody know how this is proven wrong? They use something besides plum pudding. They use something besides plum pudding. We take a whole bunch of plums, plum pudding, and we put it together on a long, thin piece. Okay? And we use gold because gold is highly malleable. We can get it really, really, really thin. So all I have is all these flattened out plum puddings with all these little plums in there. And then what we do is we take a particle that we expect to pass right through it, a massive particle. We call that massive particle alpha. Bernadette, what's an alpha particle? It's radiation. It's alpha, beta. It's a type of radiation. Muhammad, you know what it is? Two protons, two neutrons. That's an alpha particle. We call it helium. We fire alpha particles at this material. Well, our alpha particles are dense particles, yeah. Can only helium be alpha particles? Like, are they no, the same thing? it's not fair to call an alpha particle helium. Right. Because it doesn't have electrons. Right. It's just the nucleus of a helium atom. Okay. Okay. We fire them out there. They're massive particles. They have positive charges. We expect them to go straight through. Yes? That's what we expected. Didn't happen. This happened. There's actually a simulation online for this. You can go from the plum pudding model. That's what happens. The alpha particles are deflected by something massive in the center that has a tremendous amount of positive charge. Protons. Protons! Protons with their pals, the neutrons. The neutrons, the neutrons aren't positive. But they're massive. Right, true. Okay? So those particles are repelled from, from the center. So the plum, the plum pudding model is disproven by firing alpha particles out of a sheet of gold. How do you fire alpha particles and shoot a gold? You get something radioactive, you put it in a little container, you make it a long tube, you fire it at the school. There you go. Woohoo! Because I know that question was going to come up, I'm just going to beat you to the punch. 
Martha, does that make sense? Okay? Does anyone know what the next model is? Is it the gag? Gallery? The banana pudding model. No. Banana pudding wouldn't explain this. Kidney pie? Kidney pie? No. What about fried chicken? Ooh, shepherd's pie is pretty good. Apple pie. It's not a pie. It's not a fruit product. It isn't fried chicken? It's not, no. It's called the solar system model. What? Okay. No. I asked a question. You guys are 